Hi, everybody. It's Jeff. Today is your last culture responsive practice uh, sit booster of the year. And I was hoping to get some kids together, but the kids who I was going to kind of uh, use for this, I mean, they knew it. Um, they're just so busy. They're just doing lots of things. And I was hoping to get a collective of them together. But um, anyway, I think I found an alternative and I think this will work and also kind of project us into next year. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, this is our last CRT uh, booster of the year. Um, please watch it before the end of May. Take some time. Um, I'm going to try to keep this as short as I can, but we have a lot of material also to cover. A lot of it you already know. A lot of it is going to be a review. If you're newer to our school, I think it's just good to hear um what i'm going to present because it's it's our school so i want to start off with our students uh this is a photo we took back in 2017-18 and these particular students were part of a student panel that spoke to the certificate staff in our school they sat on chairs in the pac we had given them some pre-designated questions about their experiences at uh, auburn high and they did a wonderful job. We learned a lot about our school through their lens. So this isn't anything new. We've been doing this at least, you know, for quite some time. Anyway, um, I don't know for you that have been in education a long time and, and maybe not so long time, but uh, have you ever thought about writing a book about your experiences uh, being a school teacher uh, or a counselor or librarian or dean of students or whatever? Um, for me as an administrator, I always giggle. I think, yeah, that's got to go in my book one day. That's got to go in my book one day. And I, I know it's a book I'll never write, but I think we, we talk about that a little bit. So for those of you who have been working in education for, let's say, 10 years or more or even less because of all of your experiences, especially those that involve the successes and comebacks from failure of your students, have you ever thought about writing a book? Have you heard yourself say or heard a colleague say, one day that's going to be in my book or make sure you include that in your book. OK, I think we've all been there. And I would say that uh, in a lot of ways we are writing a book at Auburn High School, at least uh, um, those of us that have been here for a little bit and those that have jumped on. I think we all play our part. And the book that I want to talk about today is our multi-tiered system of supports, and it is truly a great equalizer and it is um, a big i guess you'd say organizational um, set of services that really do bring equity to a school setting because it addresses academics it addresses behaviors social emotional and all of that combined as you guys can see in that venn diagram is also the whole child okay um, each of the administrators, we all kind of delve into different parts of the MTSS, but to just kind of let you know who leads each of the effort, I'm the tier one um, administrator. I've been doing the tier one work since I've been here. And uh, Lori is at the opposite end of me. She's tier three. She's got special education background and, and just knows a lot about wraparound services and things kids need, whether it needs to be super intense super timely, super repetitive, and how to fade and all of those things. So um, she's tier three, I'm tier one. Um, Brendan is tier two, and these are things that more um, our teachers would touch, more of the tier two. Tier three, maybe not as much. But anyway, I wanted to really focus on tier one today. And the things we agreed to as a school, and the things I expect as an administrator is that we engage our students at the door, and we get to know them by name. That's so, so, so important. The other thing that we say is a tie around here that we consider a tier one agreement is our 10-10 rule. So the first 10 minutes of every class, we're not supposed to give passes out of classes. And most of us do a really great job, but sometimes it's not so great. And I really want you to think about that and well, how we're trying to engage kids in those first 10 minutes of class. That is critical. And we know if a student needs to leave in that middle 30 minutes, you exchange a pass for a phone. That's another agreement. Um, and if you're newer to our school, I think this is really important for us to review this. The third thing is um, when it comes to capturing kids' hearts, we know we do the Excel model. So greeting students is engaging. And now when we do good things, this is exploring. 
And, you know, we said kind of pick your style, learn about your students. You can just call it good things or happy things. Uh, we have teachers that call it roses and thorns, happy or crappy. That's what I learned last week. And we got a good giggle out of that. And good are just real things. And I think as the relationships <clears throat> develop between the teacher and their students, you can lean into more of the real things. The trust levels are there. And uh, I think it's most important just to, to talk about the good things too. Our kids need to hear that. They need to share that. And that's often when you're going to hear about cultural response. There are culturally relevant items that come from their homes and their lives. Okay, the next one is communication, uh, learning targets and success criteria. Um, those are things we should be doing every single day for our students. And I put the word proficient up there because um, make sure that your kids are vetting the learning targets, they're verbalizing them in their own words, same as success criteria. That's how you as a teacher move from basic to proficient. And um, that's highly critical. That's a, that's a best practice, it's evidence-based. Okay, number five, empower. Um, these are the performance tasks that you let kids know they're doing in class. It's also student agency and ownership. You know, if you had a whole period of sit and get where you're just lecturing and then you quiz them at the end, not a whole lot of empowerment going on. If you do some turn and talks a little bit more, if you get them into group discussions and problem solving and doing some exploration even more, and that's something you wanna really think about, how are you empowering your students? Doing the social contract is empowerment, okay? That's the next thing on here. It's a living document and it represents the culture and community of your classroom. It also helps you in those teachable moments and it helps you also to reinforce positive behavior. We also should have the four questions. Those should be posted in all classrooms in case you need to do a redirect. And it's also can be used to reinforce good behavior. So you can really tell your kids, hey, kind of thinking more like freshman classes right now. Maybe, guys, I didn't have to use the four questions today. Way to go. So make sure you use it for good as much as for when it's not so good. Okay, the other tight is the last 10. No passes out of class. Okay, that, that completes the 10-10 rule. And then lastly, number nine is the launch. This is when teachers, this is when we tell kids, we tell them all the time, you got to be in there those last 10 minutes because your teachers are going to be wrapping it up, checking for understanding. They may celebrate with you. They may have some kind of a story to tell, but it's really important that you have everybody in there. They got wide open eyes and they got listening ears. That's huge. So these are our tights. These are the things we expect to happen every single period, including Troy time. You know, some days you're going to maximize it. Some days you might minimize it, but don't be a minimalist. Make sure that you're doing a good job. And, and if you aren't sure of the why um, behind Excel, behind doing the engage, the explore, the communicate, the empower, and the launch, it's pretty simple. Um, it's called brain research. This is not forced positivity, although at first it can feel a little scripted or robotic. Give it time and it will become a natural fit as a tier one social emotional support that our students can receive six or seven times a day. Okay. I'm going to read that bottom paragraph. High cortisol can take away from learning. We can probably all relate having to deal with all of the stressors associated with COVID. Does this matter to you? Many of our students and their families have other stressors that can raise cortisol. And now we have a way to mitigate that. And I think we learned that in the first year we implemented. So I'm going to show you um, a different tab. Hopefully you can see that. But there's an article here on 11 ways to lower your cortisol levels. And it's kind of a quick hit, art quick, quick hit article. Um, shouldn't take too much time. But it gives you all the things that, you know, are kind of detrimental to our health when you do have a high cortisol level. And number one is get the right amount of sleep, exercise, but not too much. You can overdo it. Uh, learn to recognize stressful thinking. Okay, that's something I believe most of you are teaching your kids about. Breathe. We talked to our seniors last week about breathing, taking in deep breaths as we get ready for graduation. It's going to be a stressful day. We're going to focus on the positive and the fun. Have fun and laugh. That's what good things can do for you. Um, let me think, what else do we have here? Maintain healthy relationships, take care of a pet, be your best self, tend to your spirituality, 
eat a nutritious diet. But the big one for us guys is breathe, have fun and laugh, and then maintain healthy relationships. And that's really what Capturing Kids Hearts brings to our school and also um, helps us build great relationships with our kids and, and, and the students across the board. So I think that the, 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 for me, the big question is if we know high cortisol takes away from learning, does this matter to you? So think about that, okay? All right, going to take you on a little history walk here. Some of you have seen this before. It was um, the 2016-17 year. Um, at that point of Auburn High School's history, we didn't have a lot of interventions in place. Um, I don't want to take away from teachers. You guys were intervening with kids the best you could, but I'm talking on a school-wide basis where we did something as a system. And uh, things that were probably offered were teacher support before maybe lunchtime or after school. Summer school was a norm default for students. It was like, okay, I don't think they're going to make it. We'll go ahead and just get them ready for summer school. And I don't know about you. I'm one of those people. I want to keep pushing hard as I can until, you know, until the very end of it, until I know I can't make it. And I think we've made that shift. Um, at that time, we had one ELL teacher and we had our general population teachers and those that work with special education. We had SPEAR. We had English language arts intervention periods for three grades. And that particular year, not as an outcome, because we didn't have this, it's an accumulation of outcomes or accumulation of what we had or didn't have. Um, our on-time grad rate was at 68.5%. So the class of 2017, less than 70% of them graduated on time. The ninth grade class that year <clears throat> had a 56.7 on track rate, meaning they walked out of their ninth grade year with six credits, okay? So just a little bit more than half. The following year, we started to explore capturing kids' hearts. We also added transportation to support an after-school tutoring model. We also started a second chance breakfast. And like I said, we were just exploring capturing kids' hearts. This was my first year at Auburn High. At this point, we had a 1.5 ELL teacher um, and uh, our general population teachers. And at that time, we had teacher support before and after school and lunchtime. Again, we had our 504 accommodations, IEP accommodations, SPEAR, and our graduation rate for that year was 73.3. Our freshman on track rate was 57.8. Okay. Then the following year is when we brought in those three rocks. We brought in Troy Time, we brought in ninth grade houses, and we brought in Capturing Kids Hearts. So you can see that. We also started a uh, Commit to graduation is C2G, a lunchtime study table for ninth graders, and it just didn't go so well, but I just wanted to give that mention. It works in some schools for our, whatever reason, it just didn't work in ours. Doesn't mean we can't come back to it another time, but that's kind of where we were at that time. At the end of this year, we had a graduation rate that came close to 80%. Our freshman um, on track rate was 58. This is when our teachers were learning how to be a house team and kind of working with that, but at least the direction was going the right way. We felt good about that. And uh, just our idea of how to get kids into intervention, even though we were still kind of late on responding to it, we were better than we ever were before. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're just trying to be better than we were before. Okay, about that time, we assembled our SIP team, and that included Kim Hales, Kelly Jensen, Jason Capps, Anna Marshall, Lori Grimm, myself, Tammy Steve, Michaela Herrera, and Brandy Cole and Trinisa Bellinger when she was our on-time grad specialist. And we also reached out to Angie Stubblefield. We contracted her for some help with our equity goals. We've also had Erica Connolly step in to help us with some of our ELA goals, and she will be part of our SIP team moving forward. Emily Marsh, because she represents ELL and Abbott, she will also be part of our SIP team moving forward. But it's really that original group that you see in the blue squares um, that started out the SIP work. It's important I share this with you because it kind of helps explains a lot about how our school operates. One of the things this team did is we got into four very large dashboards of data. Yeah, a lot of fun, but it is a lot of fun when you start discovering things and you can start projecting forward the needs of your school. I'll speak to my data. I did the one that's called the ISDD. I did that with Kim Hales, and it was just a wonderful predictor to see what was coming up the pike in terms of 
what our students looked like down at the elementary, the middle schools. And we could see that we were going to uh, raise our percentages in ELL students, students of low income, students of color. Um, and we could see that we really needed to become really strong at the strategies that we're currently using right now. Um, so anyway, that's the one I can speak to. We had other people that worked with other data points and we all came together and basically we built our SIP. Okay. Um, some key takeaways from that, um, as I talked about with the MTSS, when we, when you set up an MTS system, um, this was in response to, like I said, equity, trying to make sure our kids have what they need, kind of do it in a systematic method. And what our trends were starting to see at this time was an on time for your grad rates are trending up and also gaps with on track credit attainment and on time graduation are measurable, but still disproportionately represented for the following groups. And that was our ELL students, low income, male students, students of colors and students with disabilities. We still had some pretty good sizable gaps, but when you build an MTSS, um, what we look for is at least 80% of our students, you can see that bottom floor of this house, 80% of your students are being successful on the first attempt with them. Okay, that's the tier one, the things we're doing every day that every student should be guaranteed. For the students that don't quite make it, that's usually going to be between, you know, up to maybe 15%, sometimes as high as 20. We'd like to have it lower, but we got to be realistic. Some of those kids need a little bit more. And that's like after school tutoring, that could be Troy time, that could be spirit, okay? Um, and then we have a small group of students at three to 5% um, that just need a little bit more. Okay, so that's what the model should look like. And when we're in 2019, 20, before the pandemic, we were really getting close to that. Okay, so the early warning responses and actions, and this is where a lot of the data that we're asking teachers to fill out are helping us out with. We have students who are considered low risk. You know, they're passing their classes, they're showing up. We have students who we consider as moderately at risk. And we do have criteria and cutoff points for all of these. And then students who are considered highly at risk. Um, when you were just talking about attendance, our low risk kids show up 95% of the time. Those who are moderately at risk show up 90 to 94% of the time. Those who are more high risk show up less than 90% of the time. And we all know, we have some kids that show up 70, 65, 85% of the time, they're doing just fine. So it's just, it's not applicable to every individual, but it gives us a systems um, opportunity to kind of look at our kids as a whole. Okay, so we got into 2019-20, lots of stuff happening. We're pushing out more culture responsive practices. We got some co-teaching going in ninth grade. We now have a full-time credit retrieval model. We're now in our second year of a PBIS uh, capturing kids' hearts implementation. Our ninth grade houses have more heterogeneous groupings. We did a little bit of tracking the first year and we got away from that. We wanted to have more kids, um, the most diverse groups we could have in all the houses. Um, Troy time, uh, we did a little bit, we dabbled in choice. We never went that direction because we knew our school was full of kids who just needed more inter intervention. And just for the record, just so you guys know, Mountain View started to shift that way too. Um, our transportation, we created more expanded routes for the after school um, tutoring. We also brought on Unleash the Brill Brilliance as a tier two group. And the support was mainly that first year for male students of color. They since have expanded to males and females. And they're also working with tier three. That's something they got thrown into because of the pandemic. Um, the grad rate and the ninth grade on track rate that you see in a little box on the right, I, I colored them in, in yellow there because that has a little bit to do with do no harm. Because if we got to the end of that year, you guys know it was do no harm. So those numbers inflated quite high, as did the rest of the states. I did some checking on that. Um, what I can't do is extrapolate schools that are tier one versus those that aren't. Um, but I was able to do some sample schools that are tier one or title one schools and I could see it just had a bigger effect um, and all of that. Okay, so overall, other than, you know, the pandemic getting on, what was it, March 16th, all was going pretty fairly well up to that point. And then that wrench came along. Then we had the COVID-19 pandemic. We still want 100% of our kids to graduate. We know we got some really great waivers from the state to help with that. It was a tough time. 
But one thing is you notice what happened with the MTSS and our percentages and working with kids. This is what it should look like. That was this then uh, before the pandemic. And then what happened, it became this. You can see the numbers changed quite a bit at less than 65 for most students. I would argue that it's probably more like 55%, okay? And a lot of our kids moved to the top of the house. They became tier three type students, all right? So that had a lot to do with the next model that you see here. This was last year, 2020, 2021. For three quarters of the time, we were in distance learning. And the last quarter of the year, we were in hybrid blend. Some of the kids stayed in distance learning. Some of the kids came to school two days a week. Abbott was implemented that year of all things um, successfully. And we had a ninth grade cohort of students, two different classes and Emily and the teachers who were working with the Avid site team were doing a great job with PD, getting us to use Avid school-wide practices. And we were doing quick notes or quick writes, which a lot of departments are really using well right now. So that's really awesome to see. We had uh, the Auburn Connection team, which is ACT. It was a response to tier three needs of students and their families. Uh, we had over 300 home visits. Uh, I think we stopped keeping count after 300. Uh, and we were about two thirds into the school year. So that's why I'm telling you that tier three number was pretty darn high. We moved to a quarter system at three classes per quarter. We prioritize our course standards. We shrunk down the standards and Teachers did a fantastic job of getting kids what they needed. And you can see how the graduation rate and the on-time tra on track rate for the ninth graders also dropped. Statewide average was a 10% drop and much larger in title schools. I didn't really, like I said, I didn't pull out a lot of examples, but I could see the trends. So I thought, okay, that affirms that, at least for now. Um, but we kept doing all the other things too, the best we could. I think, um, you know, if we get a gold star, it's just the way we handled the pandemic, the distance learning and all of that. Okay. This is this year. We don't have data yet. Um, but one of the things we are is we're still implementing Avid. We now have a ninth and 10th grade cohort. Next year we'll add an 11th grade cohort or add a new ninth grade cohort and everybody else rolls up. So these are the things we're doing and all of these things fall under what would be considered an MTSS. So where have all of these additions, adjustments and major efforts led us to, because you guys have been supporting this. This has been the weight on your shoulders and on your backs for the last five years or more. Um, we, have now, we now have a multi-tiered system of supports featuring three tiers of services, each designed to offer a continuum of support so we can be as nimble and timely as possible to provide for all students what they need to be successful while attending school in a large comprehensive high school setting. We have systems in place that we monitor so that we can determine if we're doing or what we're doing is really working. That's really important. Um, this is tier one. This is what tier one looks at your school. This is our MTSS. We are fully implemented now. Okay. And this is a living document. And if you look to the left, you'll see the social, emotional, behavior tiers, the things we guarantee to our kids. And if you look to the right, you see the things we do academically that all kids have access to, okay? That's kind of putting tier one kind of in a simple way. Tier two, you can see um, we have different types of strategies and whether that's for academic, whether that's for behavior, um, whatever the case may be, okay? And then this is tier three. So I guess what I'm saying right now is we are fully implemented. We do have access points for all kids to get to where they need to be. Now, whether they show up or not, that's another thing. That's something we're working on. And uh, how to use Troy time most effectively, after school tutoring. Uh, we know the research bears out pretty simply that kids who get interventions during the school day, not outside the school day, tend to have the highest chance of being successful with that. All right, so speaking of time, um, what we've gone from, I believe, um, in public education, not just Auburn High School, we're trying to systemize things, systemize practices, continuum of supports. Um, we all care about kids. We have kids come to us all the time and we kind of want to run things down for them. We want to help them when things are most urgent. But sometimes we find ourselves kind of chasing our tails or we're kind of chasing that red dot. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the videos or maybe you've done this to your own cats before, have them chase a red dot. But sometimes it can feel that way. 
and it feels productive, but you have to ask yourself, how much am I really achieving? And do you really have time to do those things? So it's really important that we use our built-in systems. Um, so we can chase dots or we can work as a collective within our MTSS with a professional sense of urgency and using timely data and respond to our students as a tier one whole, a tier two smaller groups whole, and tier three individuals to get them what they need to succeed. So my question is, what would you choose? Um, we tend to do both, but we really need to lean into these systems. And we know we're here to service our kids. This is the book we're writing together, okay? MTSS, Auburn High School, working within a system, having that professional collective sense of urgency and sticking with the system. So really that's what this was all about. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you understand why we have our tights for tier one. Hope you understand that it's not just because it's something we want to do. It sounded cool. There actually is evidence brain research behind it. We are a capturing kids hearts national showcase school. Um, everything I've been hearing from the flipping group, we're going to get it again. Um, I should be finding out this week, this week being the week of May 2nd. And as soon as I find out, everybody will know. We're an AVID school. We are a PBIS school where we show our kids how to behave positively and uh, we keep reteaching those things. And um, we're a pretty special place and I hope our kids feel lucky. I know our families do. If you look at our latest EEC or CEE data, our kids and our, and our families do feel that way. Hopefully you as a staff member feel that way. It's a great place to work. And Anyway, I hope this is a good ending to our uh, culturally responsive practices. There's a lot of this is more of the why behind it. And I uh, appreciate everything you guys have done this year. Still got a little bit year left to go. So let's just keep working hard and, and doing the things we do and taking care of ourselves. And of course, uh, working hard with each other and supporting one another. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening and have a great day.